All right. So, right. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, <clears throat> I've been an engineer at Superorbital for about like one and a half years. Um, and at Superorbital, we try to uh, accelerate uh, our clients' uh, cloud native engineering using uh, our t tailored uh, training and uh, engineering services. I've been personally doing, been doing Kubernetes things since 2019. And I liked freshly baked bread and video game speedruns. Um, so that's about me. Um, <clears throat> the agenda for today, uh, we're going to show how Cilium and network policies work. Um, we're going to have some diagrams, a little bit of YAML, sorry about that. A uh, brief refresher on certificate generation for TLS. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the problem, right? The, it's based on real needs and how we at Superorbital designed our solution using uh, all of the topics that we're going to talk about today. Then we're going to go to our takeaways and our conclusions. And um, any code that you see here, don't worry about writing it down because it's all going to be available in the repo that I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That said, the goals for this uh, presentation are to explain difficult concepts using easy to understand language, uh, provide a working example that can be used by your organization, and motivate you into trying Cilium for yourself and see if it fits your needs. So Cilium and layer seven network policies or how I learned to stop worrying and love the eBPF. Um, Cilium is a CNI, as most of you are now aware, uh, which is just an application that provides networking for pods in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it allows us to manage, secure, and monitor network traffic between pods in the cluster. And it's built upon eBPF, which allows for execution of code within the Linux kernel. Uh, you're going to hear about other isovalent products that use eBPF, such as Hubble, which provides network monitoring, and Tetragon, which is security vis visibility. Uh, and the reason why eBPF is so cool is because it can extend the capabilities of the kernel without having to change the kernel source code or having to load a kernel module, which means it's fast. Uh, the eBPF, uh, eBPF also has the capability of scanning your, your little code that you add for um, any like potential security issues, so it's also secure. So that makes it customizable for whatever your specific needs are. Um, uh, alongside that with Cilium, uh, it, the Cilium agent runs on each node as a pod, the daemon set, right? And it does most of the eBPF heavy lifting. Uh, it loads the, EB, the BPF maps, reads the configuration from the, uh, well, the Cilium configuration from the cluster, and then finally starts handling IPAM. Um, Cilium comes with a lot of different uh, features, such as like service load balancing, if you want to replace Ku proxy on your cluster, uh, cluster mesh, service mesh, and the network policies, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So a uh, network policy is just an object that you would install on your cluster that describes like how would you like to uh, limit uh, the kind of network traffic that enters a workload on your cluster. Uh, each Cilium agent will load all of the policies stored in the cluster, and it follows the whitelist rule. What does that mean? If traffic does not match any of the rules on the policy, it is dropped. If you have two rules and one of them is like a broader rule and the other one is like more narrow, then the policy will allow the will apply the broader rule. And then finally, if you have two different rules and they intersect, then uh, the intersection of those rules, the traffic that matches the intersection of those rules will be allowed. Uh, the rules are, are split into the, an ingress section and an egress section. So the ingress section applies to traffic entering the pod and egress applies to traffic leaving the pod. And if both of those sections are not present, then uh, there's no, the rule doesn't apply. So in here I have some some arrows pointing to like the YAML that I provided. Uh, at the top, you have the, the name and the description of the network policy, which just says like, I want to control access to this uh, prod DB, uh, DB that I have, MySQL DB that I have running on my cluster. Um, the second one says this, this policy applies to pods, the endpoints, right? 
that match the label prodb mysql. So any pod that's labeled prodb mysql will have this policy applied to them. And the third arrow indicates the ingress rules, right? And it says that any traffic that enters this pod, it needs to match the port and protocol to be allowed. And also it needs to come from pods that have a specific uh, label, which in this case it's employee type DBA. Um, so that's, that's an example of an, a network policy. You'll notice that it operates on the layer four uh, because you're specifying protocol and ports. So I'm saying layers, layer three, layer four. Let's talk a little bit about layers. Um, so the network policies can handle layer three, layer four, and layer, layer seven rules. Uh, the layer three apply on the basic connectivity layer. So like Cilium, like the endpoints themselves, uh, Cedars and DNS, think about, you know, if I wanna just limit traffic to google.com or a specific IP address, that's layer three. Layer four are, allows you to specify which protocol and port you wanna filter on. So think any, I wanna filter on any TCP traffic that's coming from port 443 in google.com. Um, and then finally, the layer seven rules, which are application aware. Um, so there's HTTP, Kafka, DNS support for, uh, for network policies in Cilium. And we're gonna look at the HTTP layer, layer seven network policy. So we're going really deep into the rabbit hole here at this point. Um, layer seven HTTP network policies build upon all of the capabilities of layer three and layer four. So that example that I showed earlier, it does all of that, plus it adds egress and ingress rules that are HTTP aware. So you can craft rules that apply to specific attributes for HTTP, so, such as like any HTTP paths, any methods such as get, put, patch, delete, host headers, arbitrary headers on the HTTP uh, traffic. And on a violation, instead of dropping the traffic, um, it will return a 43 forbidden uh, back to the, the, the pod. Uh, so the capabilities of this are enormous, right? You have fine-grained control to any RESTful HTTP API, and you have regex-based rules for your pathing, so you can craft rules that really target to um, your needs uh, security-wise. Um, and just to drive, point the, drive home the point, I'm gonna show you an example of the layer, say, layer seven data path through Cilium. So one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the way that this works is that Cilium injects a layer four proxy uh, in between all of those requests that uh, trigger the rule. Uh, specifically, Cilium uses Envoy. And when the layer seven policy is installed, uh, Cilium starts the, the proxy processing and all of the layer seven requests that match that rule will see its usual data path change. So you, uh, by default, you, they enter the BPF layer and then they just go to the pod. Um, so after you've installed the, the policy, you will see that the Cilium agent configures the EVPF redirection and the Envoy proxy using the XDS API, which I won't go into. Then the traffic comes in and gets redirected to Envoy. Envoy then looks at the traffic and depending on the attributes of the traffic and the rules that you have defined, it determines whether your traffic should be allowed or should be denied. Finally, uh, regardless of what the results are, the, the traffic gets sent back to the BPF layer and then makes it back to the pod. Um, and I know what you're thinking at this point, like, oh, this is cool. Like, you know, if Cilium, uh, if Envoy has uh, all this capability of introspection, like what happens if my, encryption, if my connection is encrypted? Uh, can it still do this? Well, HTTPS, yes, you're right. HTTPS traffic is encrypted and therefore it's unreadable by Cilium by default. But we can configure Cilium to intercept TLS encrypted connections. If we have this model where we have our own internal CA, certificate authority, that could be used to create certificates for external destinations, then we could just kind of man in the middle the traffic 
um, and inspect the traffic to determine whether or not it meets the uh, the rules uh, and like if it should be allowed to die before getting originating that connection back into the pod, right? So that allows to that allows Cilium to inspect and even modify any data uh, before going to uh, the the destination. So TLS and Open SSL and certificates. Yeah, PKI stuff is kind of complicated. I'm not an expert on it. Uh, so don't worry too much about it. I'm just gonna kind of skim the surface of like what, we're, what we need to know for this solution. So no worries. Uh, creating a certificate authority. So a CA is an entity that's empowered to create certificates. And the certificate is just, you know, used to provide proof that whatever you're connecting to is truly who they say they are. Um, all the computers come with the default set of CAs. That means that any certificates that are created by those CAs uh, can be trusted, right? So for our solution, we're going to be, we're going to need to create and add our CA to the list of trusted CAs on each workload whose traffic we'll need to inspect to determine whether or not it should be dropped. Um, so in here, I added some uh, maybe slightly wrong, but kind of similar like OpenSSL commands that you would need to do to create like the CA certificate. Um, and the CA will then, will be then using to request a certificate from them, right? We'll need to uh, create something called a, a certificate signing request, which is CSR, no, normally known as CSR. And uh, the only thing we really have to worry about is that the common name or CN for that certificate matches the exact domain name that's used by the client where, when initiating the connections, right? And then we're gonna use our own CA and generate the certificate, and then we'll somehow provide those certificates to Cilium. Um, I think that's all of the little bits of topics that we need to know before we go on to the real world problem. Um, at SuperOrbital, we provide training with uh, using hands-on experience with Kubernetes concept and real clusters, right? So each student at SuperOrbital gets a workstation uh, so that they can work on our labs. Each uh, pair of students receive one single code server instance, and this code server instance has full access to the outside world. And you might be saying, oh, like, you know, students come from all different back backgrounds. Uh, they have corporate VPNs to deal with, firewalls, ISPs issues, they can be annoying. And also, some of our students are pretty smart, uh, and how giving them full unfettered internet access can be powerful, and also it can you know cause you to shoot yourself on the foot. Uh, and when that happens, our lab instructors need to like you know deal with the fact that oh like that that's why our our lab our students are struggling so much. Their workstation is just completely host. Um, providing a way to uh, preventing the students from blowing up their workstation is actually something good that we can do for our lab instructors so they can continue on giving their classes. So let's create an OSHA compliant development space. No more hazardous workstations. So how do we do that? Well, we like to keep our workstations open for ingress purposes, right? We They already have to deal with VPNs and we don't want to uh, add any more layers of like, oh, you have to like go through this uh, proxy or whatever. But we do want to limit egress. Uh, some of you may have already figured out what we're going to do with it. We're going to say, we're going to say layer seven policies. Um, and just for demonstration purposes, uh, I'm going to just focus on access to github.com. Um, that's going to be the API that we're going to target today. And specifically, we want our students to be accessing only the super orbital repos in their workstations. So let's connect all of the pieces. Um, first off, we're gonna deploy cert manager onto the cluster, right? Uh, we're gonna use Helm for this. Helm is basically the app get for Kubernetes. Um, one thing to note is that when we are using 
Helm to install Cert Manager, we do have to have the CRDs already present in the cluster. If not, you're going to have to set the flag that says install the CRDs, otherwise the installation is going to hang. And Cert Manager is there to allow us to provision certificates for our workload in Kubernetes. We're only going to be using it for our CA certificate. There is some experimental uh, support for CSRs, but uh, for demonstration purposes, we don't want to do any experimental stuff. We kind of want to tread on the tried and true path. Um, so this is kind of how our certificates would look with uh, Cert Manager. Uh, and with VCA certs that Cert Manager will create, now we can uh, create our inspection certificates inside of the cluster. So you'll notice, like you know, the metadata and the uh, spec for our CA certs is pretty simple. Um, so now we're going to use OpenSSL to create uh, and in a simple and Bash, right, to create us a, 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 a script that can generate our certificates. Uh, this Bash script is going to do a few things. Uh, first, it's going to get the CA certificates that Cert Manager kindly created for us. Thank you very much. Then it's going to generate our termination certificates, uh, and it's going to deploy these to the cluster. Um, additionally, we're going to have to create the originating certificates by bundling our CA with the rest of the trusted certificates so that we can also provide that to the workload. So we'll just have our Bash script do that as well. Um, keep in mind that uh, we're going to be publishing the, all these certificates to the cluster uh, for Cilium to use and for our workloads to use. So the script is going to have to push them as secrets in the cluster. Uh, and finally, we're going to want to run our Bash script in the cluster. Uh, no one likes running a Bash script in their laptop and then close their laptop and suddenly all your stuff breaks because your Bash script stopped. So we're going to build our own Docker image and we're going to push it to our container registry and we're going to deploy from, uh, uh, from this uh, container image into the cluster. Um, so how do we do this again? With the Kubernetes job. Um, you can see in here the YAML for uh, the job definition. We're going to deploy a job whose sole purpose is to generate the certificate that's signed by our CA. Um, it runs our custom script. Uh, you can see in the image, it's like a, it's a little bit of a placeholder, but it does run like our image with uh, OpenSSL available and the script uh, uh, mounted in it. And then finally, since it's a job which runs in our cluster, we're going to have to provide it with the appropriate RBAC so it can only read, the, read and create the secrets that it needs to have access to. We don't want to give it like cluster-wide permissions. Um, now we deploy our network policy to the cluster. Um, note that the ingress section in this network policy is missing, and that's intentional. We, you can see in here that we are trying to match on github.com, so any workloads that are targeted by this policy will only be able to access github.com on port 443, and specifically the last part where it talks about the rules in HTTP, we just want them to access the superorbital repos in github.com. Um, and that's, it's so simple, right? The API for um, a Cilium network policy for just HTTP uh, control is very easy to read and understand. So that's why uh, it's the, uh, the, the best tool for this purpose. Finally, we're going to want to give uh, the certificates to Cilium so it can inspect this uh, HTTP as traffic. Um, so on the same network policy, we're going to set the fields that set the uh, originating TLS and the terminating TLS. It's going to be uh, referencing secrets that are already in the cluster, which were created by our script, and it's just the certificates. Uh, one thing to note that is that if you're installing Cilium with the Helm chart, you're going to have to set the, the, the secret backends to Kates as opposed to the default uh, flag. That way, Cilium has the necessary permissions to uh, get secrets from the cluster to uh, perform its uh, network policy filtering. Uh, finally, we're going to have to mount those certificates on the pod. 
Uh, our code server pods are Ubuntu based, and the default path for these trusted certificates are well known in Ubuntu. So it's just a matter of getting that secret mounted on the pods themselves. And thank God we're using Kubernetes because we can just use a simple combination of volumes and volume mounts and subpaths to overwrite the default certificates in the, the default CA certificates in the container with our CA, that, our CA bundle that contains our special CA so that any work, uh, any TLS clients running inside of the container can uh, trust the certificate, the inspection certificate that we're going to be creating for Cilium. Um, finally, uh, we have the results of all of this work where I am pretending I'm one of our students and I am cloning from the super orbital repo and I get all the files from Git, but then I try to clone from Kubernetes and I get rejected. Uh, obviously, you can uh, add more uh, to this policy to per, uh, be able to permit more and more repos. Um, and then you can expand the set of certificates that you can create so that um, uh, Cilium is able to intercept and be able to apply the rules. But you get the gist of it, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a very powerful tool. And the difficult part is the certificate part, uh, which is why I decided to talk about this. There are some potential pitfalls. Um, uh, when using Cilium network policies, any interruptions to the agent pod, pod that's running in the cluster uh, means that traffic will not route to the pods while it's restarting. Now, this is lessened somewhat by um, Cilium 1.14 which now deploys the Envoy proxy as a daemon set and avoids this issue. But if you choose not to do that, then this is something that you have to keep in mind that if you're upgrading Cilium from one version to another and your pods are restarting, then for a brief period of time, if, those, if the pods are restarting, the rules are not, be, uh, are not capable of being enforced and therefore all traffic will be stopped. Uh, it's a good fail safe, um, but it can be somewhat disruptive and it may vary for your workloads, like how much you're willing to tolerate that. Uh, another pitfall that w you can find with this solution is that uh, any secrets and config maps that are mounted as subpath volumes in the pod will not receive any updates. So after you've created your pod with the subpath, uh, you kind of have to restart the pod if the secret changes. Uh, for us, it's not a big issue. Uh, certificates are good for a year, and there's no class that we give that ever exceeds like a week. So these pods are going to just be blown away after a week, so it doesn't matter for us. Um, but if you're going to have some long-running pods, you gotta you have to make sure you have some you have to make sure you have some, some sort of policy to restart the pods every once in a while, so that they pick up any updated certificates if necessary. Um, finally, the code on a repo that implements the solution deploys a job for uh, the certificate generation when it would probably be better to have it be a, a cron job. Um, uh, we were using job because it's simpler and for this context it's fine, but uh, a cron job would probably be better for that. So what have we learned? We love Cilium. It, adds the, it unlocks the potential to add security and depth. And it's very simple and really fast configuration. It's performant at a large scale thanks to like the eBPF technologies. And it's 100% cloud agnostic. That's like the thing that we teach at Super Orbital. We, we love cloud agnostic stuff. And sometimes people are kind of scared about you know, not fully understanding Cilium's uh, capabilities. So they're kind of underused. It's more than the CNI, right? Um, and we want to make it simpler for people to uh, learn about this so they can use it. And that's what we do at Superorbital. We tackle difficult problems at, for our clients every day, and we help them implement uh, uh, like com complex solution, solutions such as this for, um, for them. Uh, so that's, that's all that I have for today. Um, please, 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 I urge you to go to our repo at, uh, at Super Orbital. Uh, huge thanks to the Isovalent team for their support. And for any uh, information about Super Orbital and what we do, just go to superorbital.io. Uh, that's it. <laughs>